Well, I hope you were inspired by our two speakers this evening. Um, I think we ought to give both of them another hand, actually. I thought those were fantastic <laughs> presentations. Um, we're now going to move on to our um, question and answer um, session. And I, I would encourage all of you to um, try and think about some questions that you'd like to ask both Peter and Simon. I'm going to bring them to sit beside me here. Um, just while they're coming up, we've seen um, Simon having a great passion for expressing identity, abandoning um, form follows function that um, most architects were given the books on um, during our education. And we've seen Peter um, talking about high density housing without going high. Um, quite a simple idea, but actually not many people are doing it. And I think it's a, it's a wonderful um, possibility. And, and obviously Peter's done it very successfully. And I think both architects have spoken about um, the importance of visual complexity and creating an identity uh, for the homes that people live in. So um, just coming on to the, the asking of questions, could you put your hand up? Uh, we have a roving mic which would be brought to you. And um, could you just obviously speak into the mic and our two speakers will try and address the questions. Hands, hands up, please, for the, the first of our questions. Thank you for such great talks. But, um, the question is, do you find much difference between uh, private developers and council developers? <laughs> but I go, um, well, I've worked for both, um, and I think uh, there are two ways of answering the question, really. I think, and, it, and it's really to do with the individuals who are involved, who actually control the power and the purse strings. So um, you can get private developers who are interested in doing buildings which uh, are of high quality that will make a positive contribution to a setting or a place. Um, and you'll get other private developers who don't give a toss. They just want to maximise the maximum volume, minimum price, quickly as possible. Um, then you go to the local authority um, and you will get, you know, it, it's dependent on the people who are in charge. The sad thing I found within my career is that fairly consistently over the last 35 years, there has been a um, race to the bottom in the sense that people, project managers, tend not to get fired if they go for the cheaper solution. Um, and I think that's, uh, and it, it's not all like that. But I would say the majority is like that. Um, and that spread over a number of years is having a direct impact on the quality of the built environment. Um, Peter might have a slightly different. No, I think um, th th these are sort of familiar things. I, I, I agree with you. It's down to the people. And um, we've had, we, we have, that, that last, the, the North Circular project is by a private developer. Uh, and um, he, he's quite, and, and actually, so is the, so is the, so is the step. The, the same person did the stepped ziggurat type, type building, and, and he's amazing. And um, he sees the value of good design because he can sell things for more. Um, I think he, um, I mean, ultimately, he's, he's answerable to his shareholders. But I think he'd like it to be good rather than not good. And I think he's secretly rather sort of proud of what we've achieved together. So, it's, it's, so it is, it's who you get, you know. And if you get the wrong developer, like Barclay Homes or something, then you're in all sorts of trouble. I mean, you are. They, they, won't, they won't be able to do a good job, they never have. And, um, but if you get a, the right developer, 
you can find somebody you can work with. Uh, and it's the same with local authorities. Sometimes you get a job's worth, and sometimes you get somebody who really cares. That, that, um, that homeless project was from a man who still um, has the residue of a sort of welfare state, mm. you know, uh, idealism. A, a man in his 60s now, he's retired actually recently, what a shame. But he really wanted, he went out on a limb to make that happen, you know. So it, you get people, uh, there's, a, there's a, you know, you get good people in both, in both worlds. Although I would rather work for a local authority, I think. Okay, there's a gentleman at the top there. Just while the microphone is, is making its way up, um, I think it is really important that we all recognize that good buildings require both a good client and a good architect. Um, if, if you don't have both, you don't get the right solution. Um, so, good. question at the top, please. Thank you very much for both of you. Really good talks. Uh, as a landscape architect, a long, long time ago, I got taught that if you planted an, an oak tree or a beech tree in the right place, they'd last 200 years plus. Yeah. Could you tell me, it's fresh from Thomas Heatherwick's radio programme yesterday, about the life of modern buildings being 40 years, what you'd have to do to make something last longer than 40 years in Guildford? Peter, would you like to... Try it. That's a difficult one. So uh... I think you have to start with an urban design, and because that will last longer than the the buildings will last, often. Although there's some obviously terribly ancient buildings in Guildford, but I think uh, a really big part of the, the the enduring success of a project is the kind of street layouts uh, and the, the sort of permeability and how it fits into the street scene. Um, and, you know, what follows on from that is kind of landscaping and stuff. But, um, yeah, I don't know. That's what I think. Simon, do you want to add anything? Yeah, um, I, I, uh, I think it's a very, very good question, actually. And I think there's, there's not a straightforward answer to it. And partly it's to do with planning. But equally, I think it's, it's, it's as much to do with um, people's understanding of value. So if you take a typical medieval city in Europe or in the UK, um, you look at a group of buildings, um, some of them are three or four hundred years old, some of them are a hundred years old, but what happens is the ones that are there are the ones that people really value. So they'll, they'll go out of their way to keep them, to refurbish them, to love them, to reuse them, and I think it isn't necessarily about how well they're built, because some of those buildings are not built very well at all. But if people love them, then they will take whatever it takes to keep them and reuse them. And so I think it's, it's um, if you can get that sense of pride or that sense of value into the building, then that is the thing that will make it last a very, very long time. Other questions, please? Gentleman at the top there. I thought there'd be one. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think when we're talking about uh, a lot of the examples you gave of places which people look at and say, this is fantastic, are, are the, you know, those, as you mentioned, those older urban areas where, which have sort of grown organically over time where even if the plots have been exactly the same different buildings will have been built at different times with slightly different materials for different people it seems to me that one of the challenges with designers that exist in, in a contemporary level is that a lot of the time you're not talking about of a one-off building you're talking about a whole group of buildings or an entire you know quarter of a city being redeveloped and so therefore my question is sort of do you think it's even it's possible to sort of income to create that sort of organic character to an area when the inherently nature of modern i think development and design is such that you do not get that piecemeal bit by bit uh, accretion of development over time but instead are having to take it from a from a single you know architect design team trying to design the entire area uh wholesale well i think both of our architects can answer that because that's a passion in, in each of their work. So I'm going to ask Simon to address that first. 
Um, well, I'm... <sighs> The way in which those developments are structured is they're, they're, they tend to be owned by large organisations. They go through a process of land assembly um, because they make a lot more money if they can have a bigger plot of land and they can increase the density. I think the, and that is, unfortunately, that is a, um, it's a factor of, of how we currently live and, and how urban development happens. I think there's a, there's a laziness and there's a blindness in the people who control that. Because the developer will say, oh, well, you know, I own it all. I want to, you know, you want 200 houses on this site and half of them are going to be affordable. You know, it, we have to build them in a, in, a, in a systematic way. And the people who are, you know, the planners, say, well, obviously, that's, you know, that's what they need to do, and therefore this whole issue of you know, identity, variety, trying to get any sense of condensing time, because in a sense what you're doing is, or certainly one of the things that I've um, felt passionate about is how you condense time. How do you take something that's taken 300 years to build, but you build it in five years? and yet it has that sense of something happening over time. And I think that it's not easy to do, but I think the planning process and, uh, basically does not take that on board as part of the brief. They just accept that you've got a big site, therefore you can have a big development. And, um, the, the, the repetitiveness of it is not, is not something that they think is a problem. Peter, do you want to add? Uh, um, I think it's a very, a very good point. Uh, but I, um, again, I, I agree it's kind of, kind of laziness because there's no reason why, if you've got a substantial site, you can't invite different architects. And it does happen. Uh, and it's, and it's much, things get, get much more interesting. Um, there's a famous project outside of Amsterdam in one of the, the, the uh, dock areas of the city called Borneo Sporenberg. And it's a massive development area where loads of different architects, actually smaller housing associations have also developed things, private individuals. Uh, and, and one, one bit of it is a terrace, terrace of, and there was a master plan done, which, you know, governs the whole thing. Um, but one of one of the bits is a is a row of a, a, a long thin site along a canal, where it was divvied up into five metre plots, where everybody anybody could employ their own architect to design a house, and there was a height limit on it, four stories or something, and um, you know it, it looks like some of the, the pictures that um, Simon was showing, you know, with an immense amount of variety. Um, so it's about how things are organised. Um, and, uh, you know, laziness and greed lead to it. Well, let's just get, you know, Joe Bloggs to build it and we can control it. And, um, but, but maybe a, a, a master plan of urban design, which, which divides things up into urban blocks, which, which is a kind of way of organizing space, which is very familiar to all of us. Guildford's like that. Uh, and then giving bits to different people so you get the variety. But, but, that, but those architects working within the limits of a master plan, which says you can't build above six stories or something like that. So it is doable. And there are other examples around the world. Gillian, there's a lady behind you, I'm sorry. Her hand's been up quite a, quite a time. Just, just while the mic's passing over, I, I think this um, point about involving a variety of architects to get complexity is a really, a really valid one. Um, using master planners, architects collaborating together it does make projects a little bit more complicated but it it has been proven to work and i think it has created a richness uh in in lots of places and simon you said earlier on in your presentation i think was it the bear lane project you had four different architects within your practice that yeah, was royal road yeah. well, sorry royal road yeah um you had four different architects working to your master plan to develop the architecture of that bigger single idea. So I think um, it is possible um, to get variety, maybe not as good as you can achieve over 200 years, 
um, but you, you can do it. Thank you. Um, it was very interesting to see the high densities that you've achieved um, with imaginative design. Because one of the things I always think um, when people have these discussions is that the um, developer is cast as the baddie and nobody pays much attention to the person selling the land to the developer. And usually they hold out for the very last cent they can get, which dictates high density. And, and as I say, as, in a, as an industry, no, never um, does that part of the chain get discussed about is the, the person selling. And, um, and they could sell for slightly less and say, I'd like it to be used for, you know, low density or lower height or whatever as i say it's usually just the developer and the architect gets involved after that tran land transactions happened but it's it's a big part of the process that's a good point that you make joanne um peter have you ever experienced that um um there is always immense pressure you know to uh get the numbers up and um we are often very grateful to um, planning departments uh, who have the uh, should have the, uh, the, the the interest of the city and and, and citizens uh, at, at heart and uh, are often very useful uh, and and helpful in in curbing the worst excesses of commercialization and commodification um, but it's it, it's always a pressure um, and it's about trying to make it really as good as you can. I mean, I, um, I, I think the idea that there'll be lots more people living in the centre of Guildford is, a, is really exciting, actually, and under right, in the right sort of, you know, it could be wonderful to walk through this new area and, um, you know, if it was as good as, you know, the high street and stuff, which it could be, there's no reason why it shouldn't. I mean, to add to that, the scheme that the second scheme that I showed you, Royal Road, uh, which has had the four cruciform plots, that site was owned by sort of council, and they gave the site, the, the land, free to the housing association on the basis that they built the competition winning scheme. So the scheme that we did at the competition was then the scheme that was built. Um, and so there was no land cost attached to that development. And that was the only way that we got the percentage of triple aspect homes that we would have got on the rest dual aspect. Had, that, had somebody had to buy the land, then there's no way we would have been allowed to do that scheme because it, wouldn't have, it just wouldn't stack up. Now, I've got lots of hands coming up here. Um, I'm going to take the gentleman there, followed by the lady here, and then the lady over there. And then I'll come back. Perhaps others can put their hands up again. Thank you. I wonder if there are any places which are lost causes, that you've got the wrong planners, you've got the, 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 the land ownership with the wrong developers, the economics are wrong. And I wonder if Guildford's one of those. So, can I answer that? Yeah. Yeah, but if you're brave enough. <laughs> but, no, I mean, what, what Guilf, I mean, you could argue that Guildford, it, it's a wealthy town. Yeah. It, it ought I to be. It's wealthy. Well, possibly. Um, but, you know, it, it ought to be possible to do something really wonderful. Yeah. Um, um, you know, so that aspect of it seems to me to be really good. I can't, I, we're, I mean, it's, it, we're the wrong people to ask about where it's, if you feel it's going wrong, where it's going wrong. But because, um, although I do know Guildford well, um, I don't know the ins and outs of what's happened. But um, I mean, maybe it should, maybe it should have the North, the North Street situation should have been a design competition. I don't, maybe it was, I don't know. Or, or was a developer just sort of invited in? I don't know. But that's the worst thing that could possibly happen. Well, there are people here who know more about it than I, than I can say, but there's, there's got to be something going wrong or a combination of things going wrong because you just don't get the results. 
Debenham, too much was paid for Debenham. Well, exactly, yes. And that, that's, that, that, there'll be a year next, next, next month when the Debenham site had its planning permission and it still stays there. And it's now probably 30 million pounds to develop that, that site. Bear in mind the land cost of 20 million. And you ne you, the, de the developers all right, the Qataris will never get their money back. So I just feel that, you know, they're just... It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a valid point. I, I don't want to get stuck on one particular uh, question, but... Um, I might, uh, thank you. La lady over here, please, who um, might want to address some of that question. <laughs> Nobody else has done it, but I do feel I should say who I am. I'm Dawn Hudd. I'm the director, strategic director of place for Guildford Borough Council. So planning sits with me. I'm not a planner. I'm not an architect. Um, but I do have the great pleasure of working with the Guildford Society in, as part of the design awards. And I've learned a lot over the last two years by spending company with, in, with the time of architects. So um, that's, that's been really helpful for me. Um, I'm really interested in what a lot of people are saying tonight. And I think um, I was... I was taken by something that you said, Simon, uh, when you were presenting that um, local authorities uh, want to get the most houses, the most density for the cheapest cost and the quickest. Um, I can say under my watch at Guildford, that's not how we're delivering housing. Um, and we're delivering two pretty big schemes at the moment. Um, one on a brownfield sat next to the station, 240 odd homes and a new urban village on Wayside, which is a big, uh, huge industrial site. Um, so I think we're trying to address um, the a lot of the problems you've described. And I think my question is about um, how, what can we do to fix the broken planning system? Because a lot of the things that we've talked about tonight that you've mentioned are because our planning system really doesn't facilitate what we'd like to happen. We want to build communities, but we're priced out of the market for doing really good, high quality schemes because the price of land is so high. Um, and where we're delivering schemes ourselves, we're having to subsidise them massively. There is no profit in it in local government, but we're pushed by the government to deliver the housing numbers. So how do we get that right? How do we address that balance so that we can get really great communities being built? Simon, that's, that's not necessarily an easy answer either, but would you like... Dead right, it's not. To God, if you can answer that one... How um, we can change the planning... Well... Uh, ...to benefit to get better results. Well, there's an easy answer, which is society gets the architecture it deserves. So, if as a society you put in place... Um, a group of people who make decisions on behalf of the society and those decisions are um, dependent on how much funding they've got, uh, what the, you know, what their planning policies are, what the local politics are in relation to who's vying for what, then, 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 you know, those people are the people who make the decisions about what gets built. And if, if, if there's a free reign that exists within a political structure where where people are, uh, are not being um, are not realizing, I suppose, the implications of some of the decisions they're making, then it's very easy for um, the quality of what gets permission and then what in turn gets built and equally how it gets funded for that to drift to a point where the quality isn't as good as it has been. And, I've, and I'm, I mean, I don't know Guildford, but I do know a lot of inner London boroughs, and I've seen it happen over the last 20 years. Um, and it's, and it's, there's built evidence that it's happened. So to solve the problem, I think there has to be, uh, it has to be solved at government level, it has to be solved at local government level, it has to be solved at planning level, it has to be solved at a state's level in terms of how you define what the value of a site is. And it's also got to be solved with all the pension funds and all, you know, all the people from the private sector who are funding these developments. So, and, and 
the demand, the, the, you know, everybody talks about numbers. And to me, that is something which has become, it's like this subconscious mantra that, that exists in people's heads. Oh, we have, to, we have to hit the housing targets. And if we could give ourselves a bit of slack or scope, and let's say instead of, you know, building 100 homes, we build 70. But they are 30% better and last 100% longer. And, okay, we, we, we're not so determined that we have to hit these figures, but we build less and better that has a, um, uh, a, a permanent contribution to what our built environment is. So Simon's solution might be adopting something from Oscar Wilde of looking more at the value of something. Um, Peter, do you want to add anything on well, that? Well, uh, I, I suppose um, I said earlier on um, that we really value the input of planners sometimes uh, in order to help us to do good things when a developer is perhaps our client is perhaps pushing things too hard. And um, so a really good planning department can be key to um, both encouraging good design and also um, reducing the sort of impact of poor decisions and, uh, you know, made from, sort of, uh, from a sort of commercial perspective. And um, I, those projects I showed today, um, two or three of them would not have happened without a really good design officer. When, 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 and, and so, so I think my feeling about the planning system is that more people with a design background, possibly trained architects, being within operating within the council would be a really great help. Um, people who could really understand and read drawings and um, have an enthusiasm and an interest in, in architecture and in cities. Uh, rather than simply sort of um, d d d doing policy. And um, so, so really good design officers, I think. Um, but, but as I say, we have, have been really lucky with some of the planning departments we've worked with. Um, and, and, th and then the other thing, I hope I'm not wandering off message, but I just think um, the, the, if, if, if the council has a, a say in who the developer is and who the architect is, then choose a good one, you know, because it's really hard to get a good scheme out of a bad architect or, or, or a greedy developer. But I think I just add to that, but just as important is ensuring that the value of the land is such that it allows something really good to be built on it. Because if the land, if the land value is too high, whether you're a private developer or a local authority, you're immediately on the back foot. So everything that you're trying to um, pay for and invest in is, is, starts off um, in a very, very difficult position. But you know, add to that, you know, the, the, the North Circular site, yeah. the, 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 the other scheme, this is a competitive situation which, which we won, the other scheme's got 50 homes on the site in three blocks. And just the, the, the possibility, the, the resourcefulness of the design team, which was said, look, if we build this kind of wall against the thing, we can get 100 homes here yeah. and make a, it so much better. So I, I really do think that, the, 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 you know, a, a resourceful and creative design team, you know, is a major factor, even taking into account the, the, the pressure, the financial pressures yeah. of the project. Okay, I'm, I'm very conscious of the time, so some people are going to be disappointed. There was a lady up there, Annabelle, um, who's been very patient. Um, I'm sorry that this is going to be the last question. I've got um, my chairman throwing eyeballs at me here. <laughs> uh, Annabelle, could you make your question please. I, I was just reflecting on um, what I've been preparing for at work. I'm a surveyor, I'm a valuer and uh, I've been preparing to try and uh, speak to other residential valuers about ESG in residential valuation and, and this has given me some really interesting examples of 
the S. So everyone probably know ESG, environmental, social and governance, and it's framing much of uh, reporting requirements now for, for big business. Uh, and it, it, it's a result, response to the climate crisis. Um, and it's really interesting to sort of see a lot is known about the environmental impact of buildings. And there's a lot of work going on in how we can build more envi environmentally um, sustainably. There's very little around the social elements. And you've given me some really good examples how very well designed spaces can create perhaps added value and there is some work going on now within uh, the firm I work for and others where developers are, are beginning I think to see the benefit of that particularly in the build to rent sector where people are going to be uh, resident for a long time and they're wanting to retain uh, tenants and this has sort of been helpful to see so perhaps there's something coming through from that even you Simon talked about the framework of uh, government planners and the funders and the developers and perhaps this sort of climate crisis response and also this, the new policies around biodiversity net gain, which comes into force, well, it was going to be this November, but now next year. Uh, and some of the examples you give where uh, the, the spaces are, are small and compact but green, you know, it might create a sort of framework within which some of these ideas might develop. But ultimately, if these well-designed and lovely homes are selling well and for more and retaining value, it hopefully will feed down to encourage more developers to build in that way. Simon, do you agree with that rather long question? <laughs> Well, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I mean, it depends who they're for, those houses, and whether or not people can afford them. And so... Isn't that ten, you know, blind tendencies of creating a mixed community is all part of it, isn't it? Different categories of ownership. Yes, I'm slightly confused about... Uh, Sorry, do you mean that, 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 that if you have a mixed tenure process, then that is something that will be... Tenure blind. Tenure blind. It would be an advantage in a, on a big scale, wouldn't it, in terms of creating a better, better more cohesive community? Absolutely. Um, but I think there's, a, there's, 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 there's still the... Um, even even with tenure blind schemes, and I've done a couple of them, I think there's there's still the question of what the quality of the of of the buildings are, and and whether or not the right amount of money has been put in to um, ensure that the buildings uh, are of an acceptable quality, that people will then, whether they're in the private sector or public sector, will um, make their homes and be proud of and you know, contribute to their front gardens. I mean, all the things that Peter was talking about, that sense of civicness and belonging to a community is, is if you get the right development, then both, you know, public and private sectors can be together. And, and, and that makes the scheme successful. However, that still has to be affordable. And there still has to be a commitment from both the private um, developer and the local authority to achieve the quality of a certain standard. Peter, final word, or uh, are you tired now? <laughs> well, I, I, so I just I didn't quite understand the question, but it's, it's really, this uh, issue of mixing social tenants and, and uh, private buyers, um, one of the advantages of the kind of terraced arrangements of housing that I've been talking about today is that you can pepper pot different uh, different tenures without the complexity. In, in an apartment building, it gets more, more complicated because of service charge and things like that. It's a very simple process, and it happens in the city already. There'll be a row of, of, of private houses and, a, and, and you know, the, a few kind of ones that belong to the local authority without anybody really kind of making a distinction. And so that, that sort of typology, the terrace typology, is, is quite helpful with that. Well, thank you. Um, I, I do apologise to those people that have not been able to, to ask their questions, but um, I'm very conscious of the time. Um, and Alistair would like to um, just give us a thanks this evening. Um, Alistair, would you like to come forward? Um, Alistair is the chair of the Guildford Society. OK, well, thanks very much for all of you for coming. Uh, and 
I hope you enjoyed this evening. Uh, also, many thanks to the university for hosting us yet again for the annual architecture lecture. We've had a good run of lectures in the last few years. And thanks to Ross and the team for looking after us while we've been here, making sure the technology and things work, we hope. And thanks for Peter and the Guildford Society Design and Heritage Group, who've really organized all of this and selected the two excellent speakers for this evening. And I would like to say thanks to Simon and Peter for their excellent talks and answering all the questions. Um, sorry, we ran out of time a bit. And also, especially for making the effort to get here um, during the, um, the rail strikes, etc. Um, unlike certain other person, they don't seem to have a private helicopter on hand to whisk them around the country. Um, I just say that we videoed all these um, the, the talks, and they'll be up on our website. Um, I hope within a few days. And I just also mention we've been talking about um, schemes. I should just like to mention that we do have on the seventh of November. We've got the Lewis Phoenix scheme coming to Guildford to talk to us in the evening. Uh, a rather fascinating development beside a river in a gap town on an old industrial part of the, wo the world, uh, beside a historic core, rather similar to Guildford, in fact. Um, but it's, it's uh, an environmentally sustainable um, development, mainly built of timber. So it'd be interesting to hear what they have to say. Um, so, um, if you've enjoyed this evening and you're not a member of the Guildford Society, please sign up, or if you're interested and in see what we're up to, please sign up for our newsletter. And with that, thank you very much for coming, and safe home. Thank you.